what is going on? I am Vinny Potestivo. You are listening to I Have a Podcast. And on today's episode, I am beyond thrilled, like elated, to get to introduce you to our guest, Dave Knoll. He is an executive producer extraordinaire um, in prepping for this interview. I even found out we have a little bit of similar footsteps at the beginning part of our journey. So I'm so excited to see how he deviated, and what brought us back together. We'll get into all of it right here in this episode of I Have a Podcast. Dave, how are you, bud? I am outstanding. I'm so excited. I'm so honored and thrilled. And uh, it's it's so nice of you. Thank you very much. Oh, I am I am so excited to have you here. I gave you the weakest introduction ever. Thousand <laughs> episodes of Chopped. Um, you know him as the executive producer of Amer- America. So you have your finger on the pulse. You have you're creating content that not only got us through this horrible pandemic and that we just went through, but like literally probably the last decade. Is that fair to say? (laughs) I like to say, uh, my my friend and my uh, co-creator, Cleve Keller, and I, I like to say we want to create big, giant hit shows that everybody can watch and everybody can enjoy. And ma- that will make everyone smile. That that is what we like. I to love do. it. You do, you, and you bring this. You bring that energy to your LinkedIn post. So first off, if you're listening, run to LinkedIn.com while you're listening <laughs> to this podcast, and just search Dave Knoll. N O L L. Do it is the feverishly last right now, Dave Knoll. I don't, I don't tell you to do much. Trust me on this, Dave. <laughs> how how did you get your job at VH1? Was it the late '90s when you where you started? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right out of college or in college, I I was an intern at MTV Networks. So I did, I interned for VH1, I interned for MTV. And then right out of school, a couple months later, I got my first gig at VH1. And it was unbelievable because after like, it, it was it was for a show called Flicks, which was about movies and music. And after about six months, so not long, uh, I started interviewing um, celebrities. And so uh, it started off with people no one's ever heard of before. But it got to where, you know, I was interviewing and uh, nothing close to your success, sir, by any means. Over but time, it, over time, <laughs> it's all relative. But it got, you know, it got to the point where I was interviewing Matt Damon and Ben Affleck and George yeah. Clooney and Jennifer Lopez and Elton John and all these other, and Celine Dion, and then went to producing a bunch of specials for various people um, and working with Adam Sandler and Drew Barrymore and uh, doing a whole bunch of Celine Dion specials. Um, as I say, I, that's how I first heard of you because you are such a legend, especially in those hallways. But that's how I started was meeting all those people and trying to create great content based on those interviews and uh, based on their work, those clips, those music videos, whatever it is. I love it. They're like, throw the kids straight out of college into the room with the biggest celebrities in in American pop culture. Because what (laughs) can go wrong? (laughs) By the way, it's I say what can go wrong, to be honest, not not much because we we haven't had bad training we haven't had bad managers yet <laughs> that taught us a horrible thing like i i think going into mtv when i did and it sounds like you at vh1 we were kind we were green and and oh. willing and open eyed to the and, experience and it was the it was amazing and i would highly recommend anyone to look for those jobs where you're doing a lot of things right like I was producing, I was interviewing, I was in edit rooms, I was flying to LA to to sh- do shoot, to shoot these celebrities. Um, and I learned so much. I was there for seven years. You might have been, were you there longer? How long were you there? Yeah, I was there 98 to 07. There you go. So, yeah. so you beat me by a couple of years. I was there for seven years and um, I would not give back any of those days. It was, I learned everything there. Everything. And for as much as I learned in 2007, when I left MTV, I was shocked at how many production companies there were. And I I remember thinking to myself, while we're at MTV, VH1, MTV2, they're, you know, we're creating the shows, we're producing them ourselves. I knew what a production company was, but I didn't, I don't even know if I realized an executive producer (laughs) was attached to a production company back then, or if some of those executive producers had production companies back then. So like when, what was your calling? What was the flag that you saw 
where it was time for you to to take this leap to create there, this institution so you can sell more. There are these Make big touchstones in my life. One was meeting Cleve Keller in 2003. That was amazing. That changed my whole trajectory. One was meeting Barry Diller. I met Barry Diller in 2009 and ended up working with him for four years. Cleve and I ended up working with Diller for four years. We learned everything. He is a billionaire. He started Fox, the Fox Network, The Simpsons, Tracy Ullman, Married with Children. Now he runs IAC. He's the smartest person I've ever worked with times 50. Cleve is the greatest show creator. I, I, the greatest unscripted show creator in television today, I think, is Cleve Keller. Um, but this other big moment in my life was I was working at this point for VH1, but I was also doing uh, TRL countdown specials. I was, yeah. I was working for VH1 and MTV, um, and I was creating shows. So the reason I uh, was working at that point for Bill Brand at VH1 was I had created a show called Hollywood and Vinyl, which was about the meeting of movies and music, and then was creating these specials and then created the show Don't Quote Me, which was all about great things that artists had said over the years and telling their story through their quotes. And at one point, Bill called me in to his office. Totally true story. This is amazing. He calls me into his office. I'm nervous because I'm like, oh, Bill Brand has called me into his office. It's a big deal. He says, close the door. He's got this big, giant office, uh, you know, in that building in New York City. Very impressive. And you're nervous. If he pushes the button. The door's locked. <laughs> <laughs> entirely possible. Entirely possible. And he walks me through how I'm creating shows. And that's great. And they're doing some of them uh, like, you know, the crazy specials we would do would do really well. And he said, look, I just want to I want to enlighten you to this thing. You're doing something you're not supposed to be doing. It is no there's no added benefit for you to create a show from the inside that you might get. If the show does really well, you might get a two percent raise or a three percent raise or whatever. That is not the corporate structure that is built here at Viacom, at MTV Networks. What you should be doing, if you're a show creator and that's your calling, and he's like, and you're really good at it, you should leave and then pitch to VH1 and MTV and Comedy Central and Nickelodeon from the outside. And I was, it's just one of those moments where the matrix like opened up and you're like, oh, this doesn't make any uh, sense. <laughs> and I remember talking to my wife. I remember going home and saying to my wife, and I was like, this is what happened. This is what he said. Either this is a huge moment, and he's he's saying, you're so talented. I think you can do this, and it's going to change my life. Or he's trying to get rid of me, and this is a really <laughs> creative way of doing it. And my wife, it, it, unbelievable, so wonderful, was like, I believe Bill Brand. I think you are that talented at this. I think you should leave and come back and and pitch from the outside. And that started me off on the trajectory. I think that was 2001. And now I've created 60 plus television series, including Chopped, which I, I think this year across the franchise is going to cross a thousand episodes. And America Says, which I think this year is going to cross 500 episodes. It's <laughs> It, it, it's unbelievable. And I, Bill Brand, I still, whenever I see him, I say, th I give him a big hug. And he's like, why are you hugging me? <laughs> Noel, what are you doing? <laughs> Six feet, No, Six feet. <laughs> yes. Right. There's a pandemic. Wait, that is, so, um, uh, what, so did you meet Cleve after that seed was kind of planted in your head about going out and launching it? And then what, what were you looking for? Did you know you were looking for Cleve? Did you know that she was the one? Like, how did that, how did those pieces fit together? It's another moment. And I, I say to people who are just starting off in any business, but certainly in show business, um, and certainly in any entrepreneurial business, any creative business, you have to look every day, every single day for these magical, eye opening, explosive moments that take you, you know, I, I picture this career on a, I'm on a chessboard and every day mm -hmm. I'm just trying to move a piece, one step. And then 
you're just one step. And then sometimes you get knocked over. <laughs> sometimes you get pushed back 10 spaces, whatever. I think in games, obviously. But then there's these days that shove you forward and you don't even know they're happening that day, right? I didn't know if Bill I, – I literally didn't know if Bill was being nice to me <laughs> or if he was crazy. Is he into me or is he just not that into me? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Totally. So I then decided I was, so I, I did leave. I started pitching. I got a couple of deals right away. Just like he said, I would. Un- unbelievable moment. Yeah. From and, people um, that knew you already? Yeah. I, I went yeah, back so into VH1 there. to pitch. Yeah. Yeah. Um, or I met people. I didn't, I had at that point, I didn't know anybody from Comedy Central. I didn't know anybody from uh, Nickelodeon, but I was able to say, oh, I worked at VH1. Can I meet you? It, all of these places have, have, and they still do, have these development teams. You have to figure out who these development people are. You have to introduce yourself and you have to figure out a way in. Um, and agents, by the way, often don't help you. So don't think that's the ticket. <laughs> yeah. Um it's it's just working your way in. But but the day so what happened was after that, I decided I was gonna take a lot of pitches because I didn't know what I was doing. So I'm like, well, I'm gonna take pitches from anyone who will pitch so me. Smart. So I reached out to writers, producers, comedians, and I and I said I sold a couple things, development deals, a pilot, like nothing, nothing real at that point, but I sold a couple things. Um, and I had gotten series on the air at VH1. Um and some specials on the air at MTV and whatever. I, I was building a, you know, a fire, a bonfire. So come and pitch me and maybe I'll partner with you. And the way I describe it is, so I did this for about two years and people would come in and sometimes people would come in with 10 ideas. Sometimes they'd come in with one some, or two or whatever. I got the craziest, most bonkers pitches you've ever seen, like things that still blow my mind to this day. But basically, the way I describe it is it was kind of like if day after day, people would come in and play the piano for you. And some of them were good and some of them were terrible and it was crazy. And then all of a sudden, Mozart comes in and goes, and you're just like, whoa. And that's how you that's how you do it. So Cleve came in and pitched me a show. And I was like, I thought. Two things. I the first thing I thought was, I think I can sell this show in one phone call. No joke. I think the structure's a little weird, not because I'm smart, but based on what AMC at the time was looking for. Um, I think the title's wrong, but I can we can but I think I can sell it in one phone call. And then the second thing I thought was maybe she's just lucky. Maybe she's maybe this is luck. So I wrote, I had a yellow notepad. Now I have these fancy notebooks, but at that point I had a yellow notepad and I wrote on it, call Vlad Sell Show. Vlad at AMC, Vlad Wolinets. Brilliant. One of the most brilliant television minds of, uh, of that era. Like he's amazing. And so I said, call Vlad Sell Show. And then I said to Cleve, do you have any other shows? I didn't say at all, this is brilliant. I'm going to sell it in one. I, did, I was not... And the second show she pitched was so good. And the way she pitched it with everything, every, it was a huge moment. And so I did, I sold that first show in one phone call um, and it made it to air uh, in 2004. It was called Film Fakers. Uh, sadly, it only lasted one season. It, uh, it um, But that's TV, right? Like That's early pioneering in TV. Yeah. But the, you got to try it. Yeah. And, and, um, and as you see, it was our first back. years together. And so basically what happened after that was I kept calling Cleve and saying, join me, join me. And she was like, I'm a producer. And I'm like, no, no. And one day in 2006 or 2007, I called her and said, this is it. I'm not going to do this again. Come join me. You are a great producer. But the, the, the world has a ton of people who produce. You're like a B plus producer. You are the greatest show creator in the world. One of that, I was like, I'm convinced you're one of the greatest show creators in the world. Come create shows with me. And so we've been together ever since. She said yes. She, she By the way, me. I would have yeah. gone back. I was totally lying. I was a <laughs> I would have begged again. That is, a, and it's been a very fruitful twenty years. Yeah, uh, just, just that, about, it hasn't about. been that long. That was 2007. So you oh, know, seven. whatever, okay. like, fifteen years, fifteen right. years. 
Yeah. Very yeah. fruitful. Yes. And then when did what, what, what was, I mean, unfortunately, you do a thousand episodes of one show and suddenly you're the chop guy for the rest of your life. So <laughs> It's totally you know, I fine. I love being the chop guy. <laughs> I was the MTV guy until I was like the Housewife Bravo guy until I was, you know, the a you know, all the next the next hits that they do. Um, uh, how, how did Chopped come about? How did At that, that point? Come about? Um, what did you need to pitch to the network? Chopped? Yeah. <laughs> This insanely brilliant idea and me, and that was it. Um, <laughs> but uh, at that point, we were working with this guy, Mike Krupat. Mike is also brilliant, just a great show creator, still does it to this day. He's based in LA, so we were on the phone. And I was about to pitch Charles Norlander at Food Network. Charles Norlander, if you do not know who he is, is this kind of genius wizard-esque person. I say that because he's got these circular glasses, um, always extremely well-dressed. I always found him extremely intimidating. I don't know why. There's something about his wizardry that has always intimidated me. Um, and his intelligence, the way he speaks, everything about it. And so I was about to pitch Charles Norlander at Food Network. And I said to Mike, I don't know what to pitch. I don't, I, like I, I had a couple of things. I don't love it. Mike and I, for the the two years before, years before, had been talking about the show Eliminate. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> and how brilliant that format was, where there's a woman, she dates four guys. At key points in time, she eliminates one. So now she's on the same date, but now it's with three guys, same date with two guys. And just we loved it. And then at the end, she just picks one and then jumps in a jacuzzi with the guy. And there's really at the end of the day, you know, network executives always say, what are the stakes? What are the stakes? And there's no stakes, right? Like it's literally who she ends the night with. It's that's, there's nothing, there's no stakes. And yet so watchable because it's, here's what the stakes are is that you don't want to be that guy that gets kicked off the show. Right. Yeah. So they're yeah. doing basically everything they can to impress this young woman to get in the jacuzzi with her. And Mike and I were obsessed with that format and trying to bend it in every single direction. And so he said to me on the phone that day, he's like, Well, what about a four, three, two, one? We were calling them four, three, two, ones. What about a four, three, two, one for food? And I swear to you, in the next, it might have been two minutes, it might have been 10 minutes. But it was it. I remember being like seeing the show, like the lights and the camera and the host and the judges and the four chefs, and and so uh, Mike said, you know, um, what if it's breakfast or what if it's appetizer, main course, dessert? And I was like, oh my god, this mind, dude, it's amazing. <laughs> yes, it's appetizer. And then, um, but and I said. Uh, because I remember that silver dome thing at fancy restaurants, literally from Bugs Bunny cartoons, literally from that's all. I didn't know what it was called. I just know in fancy restaurants and Bugs Bunny cartoons, they had this silver dome and the food was under there. And so I was like, he lifts the thing and that's how you're eliminated. The, the worst meal is under there. And I was like, oh my God, you've, it's chopped. You've been chopped. That's the, and Mike was like, you're brilliant. And I'm like, you're brilliant. And we had this glorious moment. And it's crazy because people will say, well, have you had any other moments, sir? Because <laughs> that's the big one. And I'm like, yeah, I've had that, mo that moment, you know, a hundred times where you think it's it. You think this is the next chop. Um, but it doesn't happen. Nine hundred and, you know, ninety nine out of a thousand times. And so... Uh, but I remember going in to pitch Charles Norlander and just being like, this is awesome. This is great. Because they had a show, Iron Chef, at that point. Mm -hmm. And they said, we might be looking for one more competition. We don't want a whole, you know, prime time filled with competition shows, which they kind of do now. But God bless them. <laughs> um, and Charles Norlander is is so smart. And he always had like he's just I have, as I said, I've always been intimidated. And my gut feeling was if I go in and I say to Charles Norlander, this is like Iron Chef meets Eliminate. First of all, that's going to blow his mind, right? Like no one's ever said those words yeah. before. That's going to blow his mind. And then I thought he's going to get it. 
he, this dude is so smart. He's going to get it and he's going to get why it's good. The one element for a legendary pitch is when they know things about the show that you don't even have to say. So when I said, it's like Iron Chef meets limited, it's four chefs. They each cook in one show, three competitions immediately. You could see it go off in his brain, all the reasons why that was good and the spinoffs and everything. And the crazy part was um, I did in the room say, this is the type of show where you could order 40 episodes a year. And he was like, we're never going to do that. (laughs) And I said, I said, this is the type of show that could be your jeopardy. It could lean into anything else. You could marathon it on weekends. Now, I often speak in very big, grand gestures. um, So I think people like to roll their eyes at me. But in this one particular case, I was totally right. Right? Like, this is their big, giant show. They can bring back a lot of things, but Chopped is the one they do 50 episodes a year. That is so awesome. <laughs> all right. All right. So I want to I want to ask a little bit about the art of the pitch. And and I know that sometimes it's so you, I mean, you you sold formats. I know that if you sell formats in TV, that means there's a lot of paperwork involved. You've kind of you've thought <laughs> out the games and the structure, the act structure, you know, in the full hour. I also know people who've sold, you know, shows based on Zoom tapes and Skype tapes. And I also know people who've sold um, TV shows on on um, articles, mm-hmm. blogs and books. So what, what do you like to walk into the room with? What materials do you need to pitch? You know, it's or, interesting. or have you used to pitch even? It's interesting because on the one hand, almost every pitch is different, right? Yeah. There is a way we pitch a game show. It's very different. And then sometimes we have gone in with articles and sometimes we've gone in with talent and we pitch with mm-hmm. a, a host or here's a judge or, um, and sometimes we go in with artwork. We've, we've hired an artist to design the, the set and the logo and, it, and you can literally see it. Um, but at the end, those are all different, different tricks you're playing. These are different levers you're pulling to help bring the show to life. That's what you're trying to do because set aside all that. We've also sold shows based on a piece of paper, based on a title, based on Mm -hmm. just, you know, me in a room talking about it. Um, And Cleve likes to say one of my biggest talents is I'm able to bring not only the show to life when it's working, by the way, it doesn't always work, (laughs) but I can bring a show to life but not only the show, but the future of the show. I can bring the the success to the show. Um, and at one point, again, I talk about these mind blowing moments. At one point, we we Diller, we were working for Barry Diller, and he basically said, "Stop pitching anything. You're you're trying to sell anything to any of these companies. Stop it." He was like, "Look." There's these shows that you guys can do. Shows like Wheel of Fortune, American Idol, America's Got Talent, Deal or No Deal, Trading Spaces. Uh, there's a show never never took off in the U.S., but huge around the world called Come Dine With Me. The He was like, you can do those types of shows where you can have thousands of episodes and versions all across the world. Stop pitching anything else. Stop creating anything else. Just, I don't, I don't want you to talk to me about any show unless there is a clear, concise, obvious path to a hundred million dollars. That's it. And that, and there's so many reasons that was amazing, obviously. Yeah. My my, my mouth, there's no sound for it, but my mouth has officially dropped. (laughs) The sickest amount of goosebumps I have ever had in my creative life. (laughs) One of the reasons that is so brilliant is because it forces you to think of every show as a, what is the future? What is the, and not the, and not the hard to understand future that might happen where you have to, the obvious path. What is 
what is a show where the obvious path, the obvious path of success isn't a million dollars and it's not $50 million. It's a hundred million dollars. And it, and so what I try to do on a pitch is bring that into it without saying those words, obviously. Like I can't go yeah. in and be like, Hey, trust me on this guys. This <laughs> one's going to make a hundred mil for you. <laughs> I'm looking in the crystal ball. Wait, the, um, I, what, what, how cool to, to, to think of you in the hallways, um, a 1515 Broadway having this conversation <laughs> with Bill where we're like cable guys and we're like cable TV is getting bigger. And there's like this structure happening in cable that we don't understand yet. Go fly little meadow lark. <laughs> and you do, which is my favorite part of, of your metal arc story um, <laughs> is that you, you take flight and you, you hear the calling and you go. Um, and then you have this other, this next awakening or maybe you know, this, this moment where the, your eyes, it's, 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 it's about the expanse. It's like about the, the possibility of where maybe it can go as opposed to the easy. Yeah. It, it's hard to sell TV shows. Don't get me wrong. It's easy once you're in the inner circle have proven that you can make shows that you say, you're going oh to my, make and, and it's you know. still impossible. Like I, yeah. we got, we get turned down. We literally just went out with a show. I've been doing this for a long time that Cleve pitched to me. Um, I helped. She created 90% of the show. I created 10% of the show. And the, from the first moment, she said the hook. I, I said, that's going to sell like, Definitely, because you can see the clear, concise path to a hundred million dollars. I could, I could just see it's like the heavens opened up immediately, and we got turned down by eighteen places. And I, I still look at the list, and I'm like, the title is great. And so that's if you're out there selling a show, or if you're out there, I don't care what you're selling, selling anything. Or if you're inventing yourself or reinventing yourself or introducing yourself on Instagram, LinkedIn, any of these things, there's a there's a there's lessons to be learned here. One of them is a great title, right? Like if 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 you have a show where it's four chefs down to three, down to two, down to one, it's a great thing to be able to say it's called chopped and they get eliminated and the host is gonna say you've been chopped. That is actually enormously, wonderfully brilliant. It's a huge yeah. moment. America Says is a genius title because it says something grand. It says in the title, literally, all of America could love this show. Um, and now uh, it's on 80 times a week on the Game Show Network. That's how successful that show is. And one of the reasons is, I think, because the title is so great. The host is great. The game is unbelievable. It's very addictive. The title invites you. So to have a great title is really important. And then to have a really obvious, great tagline, like something to describe the show in a very concise way. And so I always say to people, whatever you're doing, look at the, at the biggest success. Don't look at other things. And what Cleve and I, we watch and break down and obsess over Wheel of Fortune. That's a show that's made hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, we obsess over Shark Tank and Survivor. And these are the biggest hits. When we go out with a doc series, we look at what are the biggest doc series ever. Not the biggest thing, not what people are talking about in Deadline right now. What is the biggest doc series ever? Okay, let's try to do that. Let's, I don't want to do the 200th biggest doc series. What are the biggest doc series ever? What are the biggest game shows ever? What is the biggest example? Now study that. Don't just watch it. Don't pretend that you're an expert on it because you have seen Wheel of Fortune a couple of times. Yeah. I'm like, like Cleve and I, when we study these shows, we sit in my uh, basement. I've got this enormous screen and movie theater seats in my basement. And um, and we put a show on and watch it five times in a row. We so here's a show, we're, the same episode, and we're watching it five times. So you, at that point, you're not watching for the winner or the what you're literally analyzing by by the third, fourth, fifth time. 
you know everything about the beats that you get. How do they get to commercial rubber? So that's, I would say to anyone, delve in. You don't have to like study it for years, although that also works. Yeah. Delve into whatever you're doing 100%, 100 and go to the biggest success. What are the biggest success stories? So that's my, that's my two I cents. Love it. I love how important the title and the tagline are. Oh. And that's something consistently through podcast book. I mean, there's, there isn't anything creative that I've ever made where title and tagline aren't some, because, you know, it's, and it's not just, it's not because it's nice to have in the room and it's nice. It's not because it's nice when it flows off your tongue as the person who's pitching it. It's nice when the person you're pitching it to can easily repeat it to their boss. Exactly. And then their right. boss repeats it to their boss. And it starts at the end of the next meeting. And then you hope that it starts in the beginning of the meeting after that. It's like planting these little seeds in, in, a, in a solid title. And it used to be audio and visual check, right? It had a, it had a sound right. We had to be able to say it and then you mm -hmm. need sound right coming out of our mouth. And then <laughs> we would go to that TV guide channel and we would say, does it look right? <laughs> Can you see? <laughs> does it stand out in that slow scroll? Can I see you know? it on the grid? <laughs> and now, now that would be like a username or, or a hashtag on social media, perhaps that would be. Um, and it's all the um, same. It, it's that particular thing. Like I've heard people talk about it cynically as well, because you have to pitch this guy and then he has to pitch his boss and then she has to pitch her boss and no one's paying attention and you have to be. And it's like, okay, you can look at it cynically if you choose. But really, it's that game of telephone that we all played yeah. when we were kids. It's we've all played that game. So you know what. So if you say we've got this new game show and the title's not great and you can't remember it. And now it has all these rules and it's convoluted and blah, blah. That's never going to get through a game of telephone. Never. Like a hundred percent never going to get there. But if you go in and you say, you know, Iron Chef, bang. All right. That was a success story. Yeah. Well, we created, it's like Iron Chef, but it's like a limited. And what? And instead of one competition, there's three per hour. Oh, that's interesting. And it's called Chopped. There's four chefs, then down to three, down to two, down to one. At key points in the show, they're eliminated and the host lifts off. I now know it's called a cloche. Lifts off the cloche and says, you've been chopped. That, those are easy, easy concepts that make it through that game of telephone. And, yeah. and to the viewer, right? It, it's, uh, I always talk about it like it's like a dinner party. You want to create a show where at a dinner party, somebody can easily say, oh my gosh, have you seen that new show Chopped? It's like Iron Chef, but there's four chefs and down to three, down to two. Easy. That's so easy. Easy, easy, easy. Or like I always say, Game of Thrones. It's like, uh, you know, I was at a dinner party and I heard this and that's why this is ingrained in my brain. Um, there were these two people talking and uh, this woman said to this guy, have you seen Game of Thrones? And he said, no, what is it? Um, and she said, it's like Lord of the Rings, but it's on HBO. And that, you get it, right? Yeah, it's like, yeah. oh, it's like Lord of the Rings. It's that same kind of fantasy, crazy dragons, but it's on HBO. And he said, it's on HBO. And she said, it's on HBO. And, he, and then he said, so there's sex and violence? And she said, Oh, there is sex and violence. And you can see that guy was watching that show tomorrow. Like he was going to yeah. go home that night. He had, it was in, and that's any great, anything, any great content, yeah. a new book or whatever, it has to be so clear. So when that lady, her name's Lucy, when Lucy's at the dinner party, she can say those things. And it's very easy for whoever she's talking to, to understand it. Yeah, it's clear. It's, it's easy for her to hold on to and also easy for her to make her own. Like she isn't lost in, in, in vernacular yeah. or in sentence structure that and that's so suddenly they say, well, what are you talking about? And she, uh, I, don't, I, don't know, actually, I don't know. But I think and, and sometimes I've even seen this in this game of telephone. Sometimes we do exactly what you say you did. It was brilliant. Everything was genius. It plays this game of telephone. And then it comes back to me from the executive slightly different. Oh, He's like, oh, yeah. I love this idea. It's, you know, it's chop, not chop. And I'm like, 
is that the idea you like? Because yeah, that's the one. <laughs> it could be. Is that <laughs> it could be sliced? Yeah, I guess it's why, a little why, violent. Why am I in past tense? Silly me. <laughs> <laughs> Forward thinking, story driving, Vinny. <laughs> um, this is oh, often. I I, well, I blame us when they when we say X and then uh, they don't come back with X. They come back with Y or or you know X number twenty four, whatever the crazy <laughs> response is. I think, I, and I don't even blame Cleve. I think that's my fault. I need to create a pitch that's so crystal clear that everyone gets it every single time. And I think that has helped. I mean, we're helped enormously by Cleve is amazing. And she's the Mozart of creating unscripted television. But we're also helped by my thought every single time is this has to be crystal clear. This can't, I don't want them coming back and ha- and giving it to me in a different way because they got it wrong. I have to be correct and clear every time. And, you know, it always, it doesn't work every time. Well, yeah, because when you're pitching something new, you're usually introducing an idea to somebody, probably maybe to a world they're not even accustomed to or understand. So like what part of pitching is educating why this is important and what part of it is structuring why this is important in the context of, of you know, <laughs> Why this I would say that the, the key to all of it is crystal clear communication every single yeah. moment of that pitch. So, yeah, sometimes you are educating. Sometimes you're saying, oh, this is based on this group of people that no one has ever seen on television before. Or sometimes you're saying we're doing this dating show, but we're going to do it based on this theory that this uh, psych- psychologist had who wrote a book. Here's the book. Here's the article. Um, whatever you're talking about though, because you do want new concepts in that pitch, right? If, if you're not bringing something and I always say, just bring one thing, know what that one thing is, but you, if you're not bringing one very cool, very fresh, something new to the table, why are you even in the room? What are you doing then? Why are you there? If you're not bringing one new thing. Yeah, what are you really creating, right? Um, and that's, and that's if yeah. if you're if you want to be a wildly successful real estate agent on Instagram, that would be my response to you. What is the one thing, and you only get one, that your profile has that you're doing that no one else is doing? Now, a lot of it. You're a real estate person. So you're going to have to show houses and they better be gorgeous and it's got to be cool. But what is the one thing that one click, one thing that's different, not 20 things, not not 100 percent different because that doesn't make any sense. What's the 2 percent, the 5 percent, the one thing that everyone can latch on to? And that's that's the beautiful thing that we're all looking for when when it works, it yeah. explodes. Is that one unique sort of qualifier, right? So instead of instead of feeling like I need to find five thousand things and line them up to make them yeah. five thousand dominoes to fall perfectly in line, I'm looking for that one perfectly unique domino that has one extra dot, maybe a slightly different color, yeah. <laughs> something a little stands out. It's orange. You know, like, Those yeah, dots yeah. are orange. Just that yeah, one. Yeah. That's uh, it. Hopefully. We, we didn't um, chase anyone away from our <laughs> industry. I think, if anything, you realize how similar creating shows is to just creating posts, to be honest. If you focus on the post or the pitch, it's not the bigger picture. It's about the relationship we have with the buyer. It's about the relationship we have with each other. You are a genius. And for y'all listening to this, follow, follow him. Go search Dave Noll, N-O-L-L. Um, you'll find him. Or go... He's my friend too. So anything on social media, you can find me. Yeah, I appreciate <laughs> you listening to this. Dave, you're a rock star. Thank you much. Thank you. Thanks for listening to I Have a Podcast. For more information about today's episode, visit us at IHaveAPodcast.com. If you like what you've heard, follow us or subscribe to be notified of our next episode. And we appreciate any kind reviews.